Homo erectus, with its large skull, appeared about 1.7 million years ago. The skull had a prominent brow ridge, a thick-walled cranium, and large teeth. The Neanderthals emerged about 100,000 years ago. Their skulls had a prominent brow ridge, but had a low, flat crown, a backward-sloping forehead, and a protruding jaw. Their brain was similar in size to that of the fully modern human. The fully modern human completely replaced the Neanderthal about 35,000 years ago. Their skulls had a high crown, a shorter and flatter face, almost no brow ridge, and small teeth. Humans today have the same features. Primitive weapons. The stone worker uses an antler hammer to knock large flakes from both sides of a roughly shaped oval of stone called a blank. With a pad made from hide protecting his palm, he carefully chips away at the edges of the blank with the tip of an antler until they are sharp enough to slice through mammoth hide. To make the space for the spear shaft, the stone worker places a special striking platform in the center of the base, fastens it securely in a vise, and hits the striking platform with an antler hammer. Building Stonehenge. Teams of men would have dragged the sandstone blocks over land on sleds or rollers. Each stone may have been raised by pushing the base into a hole, lassoing the top of it with a rope, and then hauling it up. Once the upright stones were in place, the builders would probably have built an earth ramp. Using rollers and ropes, a team of men would have then dragged a horizontal stone, called a lintel, into position on top of the other two stones. Phaistos disc. The signs and symbols that run in a spiral on both sides of the Phaistos disc have never been deciphered. The symbols on the back of the disc are like those on the front. They appear in groups, separated by a line drawn with a stylus. Each group may represent a word. Some of the symbols look like recognizable objects. Here they resemble a bird, a round shield, and a head with a plume. The significance of the fourth symbol in this selection remains a mystery. This Egyptian mummy case, which dates from around 1000 BC, is painted in bright colors and covered with decorations and spells. The case was considered to be a house for the mummy's spirit. Because of this, the dead person's face was carefully painted on the front of the case, so that if the spirit left the tomb, it could recognize its body when it returned. Inside the case, the mummy would be wrapped in linen bandages. Under the bandages, the preserved body looks like this. Dead Sea Scrolls. Clay and dust that I am, what can I devise unless thou will it? And what contrive unless thou desire it? What strength shall I have unless thou keep me upright? And how shall I understand unless by the spirit which thou hast shaped for me? At first I could see nothing, the hot air escaping from the chamber causing the candle to flicker. But presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold. Everywhere the glint of gold. This Babylonian map shows the known world as a flat disk floating in a circular ocean. At the top, the scribe has written, where the sun is not seen, to indicate north. Babylon is marked by the rectangle in the center. Circles on the right-hand side represent other cities or regions, such as Uratu, Assyria, and Dur. The city of Susa appears at the bottom. The river Euphrates flows south through the known world, from the Armenian mountains through marshland to the Persian Gulf. Outside the Ring of Oceans are eight unknown regions. The writing describes these areas as home to strange or legendary beings, such as great sea serpents and scorpion men. 
standard of Ur. The standard of Ur is a decorated box. The two main sides measure approximately 21 inches by 9 inches. The war scene on the first side shows the king. He is always represented as the tallest figure. He stands near his chariot while prisoners in chains are brought before him. The king is watching over a battle which is represented in the middle section. The bottom section shows chariots pulled by donkeys advancing towards the enemy. The peace scene on the second side of the standard of Ur shows the king celebrating his victory. His companions sit before him while a musician entertains them. The middle section shows the king's subjects bringing animals, fish and other foods for the feast of celebration. The bottom section shows a procession of soldiers bringing tributes and gifts to the king. Chinese music. From a small doorway on the street, visitors entered the atrium, or entrance hall. This hall had an open skylight, and rainwater collected in a shallow pool. Family life took place in rooms off the garden, or peristyle. This open space gave the house an airy feeling. Rooms, such as the kitchen and dining room, opened off this shaded colonnaded walkway, which was an oasis of calm away from the busy Roman streets. From many points of Mount Vesuvius, vast sheets of flame and tall columns of fire were blazing, the flashes and brightness of which were heightened by the darkness of the night. The courtyard was already so full of ashes mixed with pumice stones that its surface was rising. My uncle and his companions consulted together whether to remain under cover or wander in the open for the walls of the villa nodded under repeated and tremendous shocks and seemed to be swaying to and fro, first in one direction and then in another. On the other hand, in the open air there was the fall of the pumice stones. A comparison of the dangers led to the choice of the latter course. My uncle and his companions covered their heads with pillows, tied round with cloths to protect themselves against the shower. It was now daylight everywhere else, but there it was night, the blackest and thickest of all nights. My uncle made for the shore to see whether he could escape by sea, but a huge and angry sea continued running. Here he rested. There was an outbreak of flame and smell of sulfur. Two servants helped my uncle up, but he immediately fell back down dead suffocated as I gather by dense noxious vapors. Below the deck of a trireme, three banks of rowers sat ranged on different levels, one above the other. Their seats were positioned so that a trireme's 170 rowers could all pull on their oars at the same time, making the warship move quickly through the water. The Greek scientist, Hero, discovered how to use steam power to make a metal ball spin rapidly. He lit a fire under a sealed cauldron that contained water. Steam formed and rose up through tubes, which supported a pivoting hollow metal ball. The steam escaped through two bent tubes in the ball, causing it to spin around at speed. Hero had converted heat into motion and invented the first steam engine. Oxus Treasure a dazzling hoard of gold jewellery, plaques and ornaments was found by three merchants in Uzbekistan in 1880 by the banks of the Oxus River. The Oxus treasure probably came from the treasury of a temple. Many of the pieces represent figures connected with the ancient Persian religion of Zoroastrianism. Alexander's Conquests Setting out from Greece in the spring of 334 BC, 
22-year-old Alexander began his conquest of the Persian Empire in Asia Minor. After finally defeating the Persian king Darius at the Battle of Issus, Alexander advanced into Egypt. By 331 BC, he had conquered the Persian Empire and sacked Persepolis, the Persian capital. Alexander pushed eastwards into unknown territory, conquering as far as Afghanistan and the borders of northern India by 326 BC. But his exhausted men would go no further. Alexander returned to Babylon, where he died in 323 BC, aged only 32. Vina. The tenth day of battle dawned, and soon afterwards the Pandavas, to the sounds of drums and cymbals and the blare of conches, set forth to give battle. But the Pandava army was torn to pieces by Bhisma of the Karavas, who let loose his arrows by hundreds and thousands. Seeing the strength of Bhisma in battle, Prince Arjuna of the Pandavas said, Do not fear Bhisma today. I shall dislodge him from his chariot by means of my sharp arrows. Then the Pandavas attacked Bhisma repeatedly from all sides. Bhisma took up another bow which was tougher, but this was cut off by Arjuna with three sharp arrows. Indeed, the ambidextrous Arjuna cut off one by one all the bows that Bhisma took up. Bhisma, excited with rage, took up a spear that was capable of splitting a hill and hurled it at Arjuna's chariot. Seeing it coursing towards him like a blazing boat from heaven, Arjuna fixed five sharp arrows on his bowstring. And with these five arrows, he cut into five fragments that dart which fell down like a flash of lightning separated from a mass of clouds. This large bronze vessel decorated with dragons' heads and frogs is a seismometer. You could work out the direction of an earthquake by observing which metal ball fell from a dragon's mouth into a frog's mouth. The dragon's heads were attached to a heavy pendulum inside the vessel. When earth tremors began, the top of the pendulum swung away from the source of the earthquake. As the pendulum moved, it triggered a mechanism that released a metal ball from one or more of the dragon's mouths. This indicated that the source of the earthquake lay to the opposite side of the vessel. The strength was indicated by the number of balls that fell. This mummy bundle was found in a deep grave in the desert on the north coast of Peru. Layers of colorful fabric are wrapped around the mummified body. On top is a false head like a pillow. Real hair hangs down the back. Inside the layers of cloth is the dead body of a Chimu man. He is in a sitting position with his head pushed between his knees. His body is held in place with thick rope. Deep inside the pyramid, in a secret stone crypt, is the tomb of the Mayan king, Pakal. He was buried there by Mayan priests, who laid a giant stone slab over his body. Only priests were allowed to climb the steep steps to the temple at the very top of the pyramid. Dressed in feathered headdresses, they performed secret ceremonies, sacrificing animals such as jaguars to the gods of the sun, moon, and wind. Sometimes they sacrificed humans. Mysterious statues. Little is known about the giant statues of Easter Island. The carved figures with huge heads were made nearly 1,000 years ago. The islanders carved them in quarries inside a volcanic crater. Then they dragged the statues out of the crater and stood them in place, staring out to sea. No one knows exactly how this was done, though there are many theories. 
very few islanders survive, and we may never know why their ancestors carved and erected these mysterious statues. Memorial Stone The Yelling Stone is a huge three-sided boulder, eight feet high. The first side is carved with lines of runes inside a decorative border. They celebrate Harold Bluetooth's parents and the coming of Christianity to Denmark. The second side is dominated by a giant snake fighting a monster known as the Great Beast. This probably symbolizes the old gods and their struggle against evil. A giant painting of Christ on the cross covers the third side. Ribbons and plant patterns twist and turn around his body. This scene represents the triumph of Christianity. Then they let the spears, hard as a file, go from their hands. Let the darts, ground sharp, fly. Bows were busy, shield received point. Better was the rush of battle. The Bayer Tapestry includes many scenes from the Norman invasion of England. William's army set sail in a fleet of Viking-style longships. Some of the ships had fierce figureheads. Even horses made the crossing. Further along the tapestry is a scene of the Normans preparing for battle by feasting on hot soup or stew and meat cooked on a grill. Later scenes show the two armies meeting near Hastings in southern England. The English soldiers, led by King Harold II, gathered on a hill behind a wall of shields. The Normans showered them with arrows and charged them with cavalry. Many soldiers on both sides were killed. The final battle scenes show how the Normans lured the English off the hill and defeated them in open battle. King Harold and hundreds of other English soldiers were killed by the Norman cavalry. Rutum. Land for 20 ploughs. 76 villagers with 18 smallholders have 14 ploughs. A church, 10 slaves, 3 mills at 15 shillings. Meadow, 9 acres. Woodland, when fruitful, 500 pigs. Total value of this manor before 1066, 15 pounds. Now, the Archbishop's Lordship is assessed at 24 pounds. However, it pays 35 pounds. The men-at-arms, 11 pounds. The four evangelists, St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, and St. John can each be identified by the symbol that appears above their heads. St. Matthew is identified by a winged man symbolizing Jesus Christ. For St. Mark, a winged lion blowing a trumpet represented Christ's resurrection. St. Luke was associated with a winged calf symbolizing Christ's sacrifice. St. John's symbol was an eagle carrying a book representing Christ's ascension into heaven. Chinese Poetry In the mountains on a summer day, a poem by Li Po. Gently I stir a white feather fan with open shirt sitting in a green wood. I take off my cap and hang it on a jutting stone. A wind from the pine tree trickles on my bare head. Ethiopian Lyre The graceful brushstrokes that make up a Chinese character must be written in a specific order. This character, called Yong, meaning eternal, is made up of five strokes. This device, made up of a hollow cylinder containing a spiral screw, was designed to lift water. To do this, the lower end was placed in a lake or river. The wheel at the upper end was turned to move the cogs of a second wheel, which was attached to the inner spiral. The spiral rotated and carried water upwards along the thread of the screw to fill a reservoir. 
Farmers could then take the water to the fields to grow crops. The Archimedes screw is still used for irrigation today, thousands of years after it was invented. The crossbowman slowly wound the handles of the crannykin, pulling the bowstring taut. He used a catch to hold the bowstring in the loading position while he picked up a bolt. After carefully loading the bolt in a groove, he took aim. He pressed the trigger and fired. And some Musa visits Mecca. Setting out from Mali, Mansa Musa traveled north, passing by Walata. His caravan of 60,000 people, including a baggage train of 80 camels, each carrying 300 pounds of gold, crossed the Sahara Desert, resting at the Tuat Oasis. Mansa Musa made his way along the coast of North Africa to Cairo, where he was guest of the Sultan. From Cairo, the pilgrims traveled down the coast of the Red Sea to Mecca. Such was Mansa Musa's generosity that by the time he reached Cairo on his return journey, he had given away all his gold. Crusades. The Crusaders gloriously entered the city at noon on the day known as Dies Veneris, the day on which Christ redeemed the whole world on the cross. Amid the sounds of trumpets and with everything in an uproar, they attacked boldly, shouting, God help us! At once, they raised the banner on the top of the wall. The pagans were completely terrified, for they all exchanged their former boldness for headlong flight through the narrow streets of the city. The more swiftly they fled, the more swiftly they were pursued. The longbow archer pulled the bowstring back as far as his cheek, took careful aim, and fired. The arrow flew rapidly towards its target. It could pierce armor at a distance of over 200 yards. The longbow was also quick to reload. The archer kept his arrows on the ground in front of him and could fire up to 12 arrows in a minute. Setting off from Nanjing with a fleet of ships and a crew of more than 20,000, Cheng Ho sailed south to Vietnam and on to Indonesia. Crossing the Indian Ocean, he stopped in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. From Ceylon, he traveled up the coast of India to the Persian Gulf, visiting Hormuz. He even reached the trading center of Malindi on the eastern coast of Africa, returning with a live giraffe. It would be almost a century before European sailors attempted such daring sea voyages. The Mongol Empire was the largest land empire the world has ever known. By 1294, it incorporated parts of China, Persia, and Russia, and stretched over 5,000 miles, from the Pacific Ocean in the east to the Black Sea in the west. At Karakorum, Genghis Khan rallied his warriors and led them into northern China in 1211, invading the Qin Empire. Beijing was captured by the Mongols in 1218. The first phase of Mongol expansion was complete. Persia and the Muslim states of Central Asia were conquered by the Mongols in 1224. The Mongol Empire now stretched as far west as the Caucasus in southern Russia. Russia was invaded by 150,000 Mongol warriors in the winter of 1237, the only successful winter invasion of Russia in history. Kiev was stormed in 1240. The Mongols raided Poland and Hungary, but were unable to extend their empire any further west. At Ain Jalut in 1260, the Mongols suffered their first defeat at the hands of the Egyptian warriors, the Mamluks. Undeterred, 
the Mongols had conquered southern China by 1279. The Mongol Empire had reached its greatest extent by 1294. Yurts were quick to construct and easy to dismantle, and suited the Mongols' nomadic way of life. They were made of wooden poles latticed together to form a circle that was 20 feet in diameter. Wooden rafters then formed the roof. The frame was covered with animal skins, or mats of thick felt, which were held in place by ropes. Felt coverings were often brightly embroidered and greased to keep out the wind and rain. Samurai Sword The warriors are all dead. They lie on the moor field. Their swords lie beside them, their black bows in their hand. Though their limbs were torn, their hearts could not be repressed. They were more than brave. Steadfast to the end, they could not be daunted. Their bodies were stricken but their souls have taken immortality. Captains among the ghosts. Heroes among the dead. This Aztec ritual calendar was used mainly for fortune-telling. Divided into 13 rounds of 20 days, each of the days was named for an animal or plant, or for natural phenomena such as earthquakes or wind. Priests studied this calendar before special events, such as births, marriages, or journeys, to determine whether the day was lucky, unlucky, or neutral. Magna Carta Magna Carta Clause 20 For a trivial offence, a free man shall be fined only in proportion to the degree of his offence, and for a serious offence, correspondingly but not so heavily as to deprive him of his livelihood. In the same way, a merchant shall be spared his merchandise, and a husbandman the implements of his husbandry, if they fall upon the mercy of a royal court. None of these fines shall be imposed except by the assessment on oath of reputable men of the neighborhood. Clause 39. No man shall be seized or imprisoned, or stripped of his rights or possessions, or outlawed, or exiled, or deprived of his standing in any other way. Nor will we proceed with force against him, or send others to do so, except by the lawful judgment of his equals, or by the law of the land. Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal is the most famous building in India. This white marble tomb stands on the banks of the Jumna River, outside the city of Agra. 20,000 workers worked for 11 years, from 1632 to 1643, to complete it. The surfaces are inlaid with intricate patterns of semi-precious stones. Shah Jahan is buried inside next to his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. Saint Alexis. Alexis was born in Moscow in the 1290s. As a young boy, he was educated by a monk. He was taken into a monastery and became Bishop of Vladimir in 1352. As bishop, Alexis welcomed many young monks into the church. On a visit to Southern Asia, he is said to have healed the diseased eyes of a Mongol official. Alexis died in 1378. Many worshippers came to visit his tomb. One brought a dead child, who was supposedly brought back to life in a miracle. In the years after his death, Alexis' reputation as a miracle worker spread. Thousands of believers flocked to his tomb. Wives of Henry VIII Catherine of Aragon was a Spanish princess. She married Henry VIII in 1509, seven weeks after he became king. She bore him five children, but no sons who survived. In 1533, Henry asked an English archbishop to annul the marriage. Anne Boleyn was Henry's second wife. They had two children, but the only son was born dead. 
Henry had Anne beheaded on the 19th of May, 1536. Jane Seymour married Henry 11 days later. She gave him a son, Edward, but the birth was difficult and 12 days later, Jane died. Anne of Cleves was a German princess. Henry married her in 1540, solely for political reasons. Their marriage was annulled by Parliament six months later. Catherine Howard, another Englishwoman, became Henry's fifth wife. A year after their wedding, she admitted that she had not been faithful. She was beheaded in February 1542. Catherine Parr became Henry's sixth wife in 1543. She was well educated and had been divorced twice herself. Catherine was still queen when Henry died in 1547. The Last Supper shows Christ and the twelve disciples seated at a long table. Their heads are aligned along the painting's horizon line. The tops of the windows create diagonal lines that lead to Christ's head. This is the vanishing point of the picture. The table and the arms of several disciples create further lower diagonals. The lines of the ceiling also lead the viewer's eye towards the central figure of Christ. A vertical line positions Christ in the exact center of the scene. Leonardo's Notebooks This drawing of a chariot, seen at the top, was one of Leonardo's ingenious designs for war machines. It has scythes to mow down anything in its path. Below is a design for an eight-man armored car with wheels turned by hand cranks. This unusual drawing shows an excavating machine which would pile up earth to render an enemy's walls ineffective. This design for a catapult would work like a giant crossbow on wheels. Shakespeare's Theater. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Are not the things we see a dream? Gazing on such wonderful sights, we did not know what to say, or whether what appeared before us was real. For on one side of the land, there were great cities, and in the lake, ever so many more. And the lake itself was crowded with canoes, and in the causeway were many bridges at intervals. And in front of us, stood the great city of Mexico. And we, we did not even number 400 soldiers. Veracruz Harp. To unknown waters. Columbus left Cadiz, Spain, with three ships on the 3rd of August 1492. He reached unknown waters on the 6th of September. At first the winds were strong, but the ships were becalmed on the 25th of September and drifted for more than a week. The wind picked up again and the ships continued westwards. On the 12th of October, the lookout saw cliffs glowing in the moonlight. It was the island of San Salvador. They had reached America. On the 8th of July, 1497, da Gama left Lisbon, Portugal with four ships. He stopped in the Cape Verde Islands before sailing into the uncharted South Atlantic. Despite storms and mutinies, he finally rounded the Cape of Good Hope at the tip of Africa three months later. The expedition continued up the east coast of Africa as far as Malindi. Here, da Gama met a skillful Indian pilot who helped him cross the Indian Ocean. They landed in Calicut, India, on the 20th of May, 1498. 
Magellan left a port near Seville, Spain, on the 10th of August, 1519, with five ships and 270 men. He crossed the Atlantic and sailed down the coast of South America to Patagonia, where he discovered the passage now known as the Straits of Magellan. On the 28th of November, 1520, he reached a new ocean, which he called the Pacific. Magellan sailed west across the Pacific Ocean. By then, four ships had been lost, and most of the men had died. Magellan himself was killed in the Philippines. His ship, Victoria, continued the voyage westwards. After more than three years at sea, the ship made it back to Spain on the 6th of September, 1522. Only 17 of the original 270 sailors were on board. The nocturnal was used in the northern hemisphere to tell the time at night. The navigator held it at arm's length and looked through the viewing hole at the bright pole star, which always stays low in the northern sky. He then identified two other bright stars in the same constellation that formed a straight line. He moved the arm until it was lined up with the three stars. The reading on the timescale disc gave the time to within about ten minutes. Benin Bronzes Benin bronze workers made realistic sculptures of people and animals that decorated Benin kings' palaces and religious shrines. The Benin kings strictly controlled the production of these bronzes so that the artistic standards remained consistently high. The peasants who worked in the fields wore simple clothes made of coarse linen. Merchants wore kimonos with rich but restrained patterns. Samurai warriors wore armor made of thin metal or leather plates laced together with silk cords. Nobles were allowed to wear richly colored kimonos and jackets. Samurai armor was made of thin metal plates laced together with silk cords. The helmet was made of riveted iron plates. This helmet is decorated with the horns of a water buffalo. Sometimes the samurai wore a protective mask of a scowling face to frighten his enemies. The sleeves of the armor were made of laced plates and chainmail, so that the samurai was able to use his sword freely. Heavy shoulder plates were attached with cords to the shoulder straps of the armor. These pieces of armor combined to give the samurai excellent protection in battle. Setting out from Beijing in April 1661, Gruber and Dorville traveled west along an ancient caravan route to Shan. They exchanged their horses for sturdy yaks as their journey took them into Tibet, over mountains and high plateaus. In October 1661, they reached Lhasa, becoming the first Europeans to enter the Tibetan capital and see the Patala Palace, built into the mountainside where the Tibetan ruler, the Dalai Lama, lived. They traveled on to Kathmandu, finally reaching Agra in India 11 months after they had left Beijing. Here Dorville fell ill and died. Gruber continued on to Europe, where he told of his adventures. Clockwork Universe When the handle of the orrery is turned, the planets begin to orbit the Sun. On this orrery, the furthest planet from the Sun is Uranus, which takes 84 times longer to complete one orbit. The planets Neptune and Pluto do not appear on this orrery because they were not discovered until after it was made. A typical courtier at Louis XIV's court at Versailles wore a long curled periwig, a fashion introduced by Louis XIV himself. His silk cravat was trimmed with lace and tied in a bow. Rows of buttons and ribbon loops decorated his fitted coat. His heavy coat cuffs were buttoned back to show the lacy sleeve of his shirt. His waistcoat was made of a fashionable heavy brocade. He wore silk stockings and high-heeled shoes with square toes. Siege of Magdeburg In May 1631, Count Tilly, the commander of the Holy Roman Emperor's army, laid siege to Magdeburg, a strategic crossing point on the River Elbe in Germany. 
Tilly's main army was made up of soldiers armed with a type of spear known as a pike. They were supported by musketeers and cavalry. The heavy guns to bombard the city's geometric fortifications were pulled into place by horses. Because of the brutal destruction of the city, Tilly was named the Butcher of Magdeburg. Spice Islands. The Spice Islands in the East Indies, now Indonesia, provided most of Europe's supply of spices. Nutmeg was grown in the Banda Islands and cloves in Ambon. Cinnamon was the Dutch East India Company's most profitable spice. The spices were taken to Batavia on the island of Java, which was the Dutch capital in Indonesia. From there, the spices were taken by ship to Europe. Vile. The Mayflower. Wednesday, the 6th of September. The wind coming east northeast, a fine small gale. We loosed from Plymouth, and after many difficulties in boisterous storms, at length, by God's providence, upon the 9th of November following, by break of day, we espied land, which we deemed to be Cape Cod. And so afterwards it proved and the appearance of it much comforted us, especially seeing so goodly a land, and wooded to the brink of the sea. Blackbeard the Pirate Blackbeard deliberately cultivated a frightening appearance. When facing his enemies, he placed lighted fireworks in his hair to terrify them. He grew a large black beard which gave him his nickname. Blackbeard was always heavily armed with various weapons, including several pistols stuck in his belt. Diverse peoples. The Iroquois were warlike people from the forests of what is now New York State. They wore war paint and fought with clubs and short axes known as tomahawks. The Hydatsa farmed corn and squash on the Great Plains in what is now North Dakota. This dancer is wearing a feathered headdress and carrying a bow and arrow. The Tlingit lived in massive cedar longhouses in the lush forests of the Pacific Northwest. This man is holding a rattle and wearing a ceremonial cape and mask. The Hopi were farmers who lived in high villages in the deserts of Arizona. This dancer in a wooden mask represents the spirit of a dead ancestor. Declaring independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. The slaves are never allowed the least bedding, either sick or well but are stowed on the bare boards, from the friction of which, occasioned by the motion of the ship and their chains, they are frequently much bruised, and in some cases the flesh is rubbed off their shoulders, elbows and hips. The men are constantly chained, two and two, the right leg of one to the left leg of the other. Some wet and blowing weather having occasioned the portholes to be shut and the grating to be covered, Fluxes and fevers ensued. I frequently went down among them, till at length their apartment became so extremely hot as to be only sufferable for a very short time. It is not in the power of human imagination to picture a situation more dreadful or disgusting. 
Numbers of the slaves had fainted. They were carried upon deck, where several of them died. Flintlock muskets. In the heat of battle, it was vital that infantry soldiers followed orders and fired their weapons together. They were vigorously drilled on the parade ground to make them keep formation. One row of soldiers stood ready while the front row knelt to take aim. When the officer gave the command, both rows fired their muskets together. I shall never forget the scene which the field of battle presented about seven in the evening. Our division, which had stood upwards of 5,000 men at the commencement of battle, had gradually dwindled down to a solitary line of skirmishers. The 27th Regiment were lying literally dead a few yards behind us. Nothing met my eye except the mangled remains of men and horses. I'd never heard of a battle in which everybody was killed, but this seemed likely to be an exception. Lord Wellington galloped up to us at the instant, and our men began to cheer him, but he called out, No cheering, my lads, but forward and complete the victory! The streets were lined with citizens all armed, some with pikes and some with guns. The carriage stopped in the middle of a large space that had been left around the scaffold. I heard the king pronounce distinctly these memorable words. I die innocent of all the crimes laid to my charge. I pardon those who have occasioned my death, and I pray to God that the blood you are going to shed may never be visited on France. He was proceeding when a man on horseback ordered the drums to beat. Many voices were at the same time heard encouraging the executioners. They dragged him under the axe of the guillotine, which with one stroke severed his head from his body. All this passed in a moment. The youngest of the guards, who seemed about 18, immediately seized the head and showed it to the people as he walked around the scaffold. Bala Laika. Of all the plants we have seen, the most excellent in its kind is the plant Formium tenax. Of the leaves of these plants, with very little preparation, all their common wearing apparel are made, and all strings and lines for every purpose, of a strength so much superior to hemp as scarce to bear comparison with it. By another preparation, a kind of snow-white fibre is drawn from the leaves, shining almost as silk, and surprisingly strong, of which all the finer clothes are made. By splitting the leaves into proper breaths, and tying those strips together, are made their fishing nets. So useful a plant would doubtless be a great acquisition to England, especially as one might hope that it would thrive there with little trouble as it seems hardy and affects no particular soil. The performers, a one hundred or more, had been summoned by the chief. Their polished skins reflected the light of the torches and they were fantastically adorned with feathers. We had a fan dance, a dance with a bow and arrow, a club dance. The performance consisted of a slow advance towards the spectators, the men gracefully swinging their bodies. They kept exact time, every movement being executed as by one man. The last dance evidently simulated the skirmish, the charge, the alternative advance and retreat before an enemy. It would be difficult to exaggerate the picturesque and imposing effect produced by these warriors as they gradually emerged from the darkness of the night into the blaze of the torchlight. Cook arrived in New Zealand in October 1769. He met a delegation of Maoris, the native inhabitants of New Zealand. He and his crew traded food and supplies with them. After six months charting New Zealand, the explorers sailed further westwards. They sighted the coast of Australia on the 19th of April 1770. 
At Botany Bay, near the modern city of Sydney, the crew collected hundreds of new species of plants. They were amazed to see a kangaroo. Cook sailed north, surveying the coast. The ship ran aground in the treacherous waters of the Great Barrier Reef. Cook managed to refloat it and land on the beach. After patching up a hole in the ship, the explorers continued their voyage. Near the northern tip of Australia, Cook went ashore and raised a flag to claim the country for Britain. One hundred and ninety-nine men began constructing the Eiffel Tower in June 1887. Twenty-two months later, in April 1889, the Eiffel Tower was completed. The workers had used no less than two and a half million iron rivets, and the tower stood 984 feet high. Edward Mybridge took this sequence of photographs in the 1870s. They proved for the first time that a horse lifts all four hooves off the ground at once when cantering. Mybridge showed his photographic sequences using a projector to give the impression of movement. This was an important step towards the invention of the movies. Steam power brought many changes to Britain. Coal was burnt to heat water. This produced steam that, when harnessed, could drive machines. Hand-operated machines were replaced by steam-powered machines that could do the same work much faster. Because of this, goods were manufactured more cheaply, and Britain became the world leader in manufacturing textiles and many other goods. First, photographs. The person wanting to be portrayed is posed with his face turned towards the sun. The head is fixed with a kind of neck iron. Opposite the sitter stands a big square box in which the operator is hidden with his daguerreotype. He calls out to the patient to put on a cheerful expression and hardly is the latter ready with his grimace than his image is fixed on the silver plate with a surprising likeness. Before you have recovered from your astonishment at the wonder of physics, the picture is fixed by a chemical process Beautiful frames of every size and price are in stock, and before five minutes have passed, the visitor receives his image excellently carried out and nicely framed. Faraday's motor. Faraday discovered that he could make a current carrying wire move when he placed it next to a magnet. He connected a supporting arm to a battery and suspended a wire from it. The end of the wire rested next to a magnet in a dish of mercury. The dish of mercury was connected to the battery in order to complete a circuit. When a current was passed through the circuit, a temporary magnetic field formed around the current carrying wire. The magnetic field around the wire interacted with the magnetic field around the magnet, causing the wire to move. Faraday had invented the first electric motor, but it was to be another 60 years before his invention was put to practical use. Fabergé egg. Fabergé designed his eggs to open and reveal an intricate treasure. This diamond and ruby encrusted egg contains a miniature golden ship set in an aquamarine sea. Every detail of the ship is accurately reproduced, down to the finely worked rigging. Each Fabergé egg was a unique work of art. In 1841, Livingston arrived in Cape Town to start his first expedition to the Limpopo River, during which he was nearly killed by a lion. On his second expedition, Livingston travelled up to Luanda, then crossed the African continent from west to east. Livingston's third expedition, to explore the Zambezi River, was made on behalf of the British government. They hoped that he would find a direct route into Africa, but his party was halted by rapids and had to turn back. In 1866, Livingston began his fourth and last expedition from the island of Zanzibar. This was an unsuccessful quest for the source of the River Nile. In 1871, an American newspaper hired an adventurer named Henry Morton Stanley to look for Livingston. He found Livingston at Ujiji and tried to persuade him to leave Africa, but Livingston refused. Livingston died in Africa aged 60 in May 1873.
1917, the women's rights movement in the United States organized a series of marches to increase pressure for reform. Leading figures in the movement, such as Lillian Russell, made inspired public speeches about inequality. The police responded by arresting some of the campaigners. In 1920, Congress finally passed the 19th Amendment, which asserted the right of women to vote. Here, Vice President Marshall signs the document that changed women's lives. The Railroad During the 1800s, thousands of miles of railways were built in the United States. Railway builders worked by hand using pickaxes and shovels. Iron spikes were hammered in to fix the rails to the wooden sleepers. Winches were used to move the heavy pieces of metal track. The railways opened up new territories and helped to link the United States together. By the early 1900s, most North Americans were no more than 25 miles from a railway. Totem Poles This totem pole is made up of an eagle, a bear and a human. The figures on a totem pole tend to be stylized. The beak of an eagle, for example, is always shown with an exaggerated downwards curve. The outstretched wings are magnificently carved and painted. The bear is shown as a fearsome creature, snarling and ready to attack. Humans are by tradition painted red. This human is tightly gripped in the bear's arms. We hear highly resolved that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The very earliest movies simply recorded scenes from everyday life. By the early 1920s, Hollywood was the base for many filmmaking studios who were attracted by the sunny weather, variety of scenery, and cheap labor. The studios made epic movies with huge casts and elaborate sets for the newly built movie theatres. They also often produced stunning special effects. Early cameras were cranked by hand. Equipment became more complex after sound was introduced. After World War II, the heyday of the great studios was over, as more and more of the public stayed at home to watch television. The Model T Ford, first produced by Henry Ford in 1908, caused a revolution in car making. It was the first car to be mass produced, using standardized parts and a moving assembly line on which each worker did a single repetitive task. Ford cut the production time for a car from several days to a few hours. This lowered the cost of the Model T so that more people could afford to buy one. By 1920, Half the cars in the world were Model T Fords. Russian Revolution On the morning of the 7th of November 1917, a small band of Bolshevik revolutionaries entered the deposed Tsar's Winter Palace in Petrograd, now St. Petersburg. By the end of the day, hundreds of revolutionaries occupied the palace. The provisional government fell, and Lenin, the leader of the Bolsheviks, seized power in Russia. Bolshevik Propaganda Sailors, comrades, as I greet you, I still don't know whether you have faith in all the promises of the provisional government. What I know for certain, though, is that when sweet promises are made, you are being deceived in the same way that the entire Russian people are being deceived. Sailors, comrades, we have to fight for a socialist revolution. The fight until the proletariat wins full victory. Long live the worldwide socialist revolution.
World War II, Europe. Over 5,000 ships carried 156,000 Allied troops across the English Channel in the early hours of the 6th of June, 1944. US, British and Canadian troops made their way from their ships onto the landing craft that transported them to the beaches along the Normandy coastline in northern France. This was the beginning of Operation Overlord, codenamed D-Day, the greatest maritime invasion in history. The Allied troops met heavy German resistance. Fighting was fierce and the loss of life was high. Approximately 10,000 Allied soldiers were killed, wounded or reported missing. By the end of the day, the Allies had landed ten divisions of arms and supplies. The liberation of Western Europe from Nazi occupation had begun. London Blitz Between September and November 1940, the German Air Force dropped almost 100,000 bombs on London. This was called the Blitz. All night, fires blazed around the city. Over 13,000 civilians died in the three months of the London Blitz. Some Londoners slept on underground platforms in central London to escape the devastation caused by the bombs. World War I Death was never far away for soldiers fighting on the Western Front in World War I as heavy artillery kept up continual bombardment. Machine guns cut down soldiers as they emerged over the top of their trenches. The newly developed tank protected advancing troops from the constant barrage of gunfire. In the war at sea, submarines attacked shipping lanes, sinking passenger, cargo and naval vessels with torpedoes. A direct hit by one of these self-propelled underwater missiles could sink a ship with bewildering speed. Gas attack. At 5 p.m., a furious bombardment suddenly recommenced. A strange yellowish-green cloud appeared from the German line in the north, drifting low on the evening breeze toward our trench. It burned my throat, caused pains in my chest, and made breathing all but impossible. I spat blood and suffered dizziness. We all thought that we were lost. What is life like in the trenches? Well, muddy and cramped and filthy. Everything gets covered in mud. There's no room. And if you walk upright in many of the trenches, you run grave risks. Of course, one gets greasy and smutty, and the place smells bad, as you can imagine. All day long, shell and rifle bullets go banging and whistling. And from dawn to midnight, the Huns fire rifle rounds and machine guns at us. Attack on the GPO. At daybreak on Friday, the fight broke out with renewed venom. The enemy's artillery came into action shortly after dawn to the accompaniment of continuous bursts of machine gun fire. Towards dusk, the building was alight in every quarter, and the front apartments were nothing short of a roaring furnace. A general mobilisation was ordered to take place in the large sorting rooms at the rear. The evacuation began about 8 o'clock on Friday night. General Pierce stood near the door until the last of the contingent passed safely through. He then went back into the blazing building and made a hasty search through the rooms to assure himself that no one was left behind in the doomed structure. After what seemed an interminable time, Pierce returned, begrimed with soot and dust, his eyes and face swollen with the heat, and passed through to the street. The defence of the GPO, our first field general headquarters, was at an end. The Turkish Ottoman Empire ruled the Middle East and Asia Minor in 1914. After fighting on the losing side in World War I, the empire broke up. In 1920 in the Middle East, Iraq, Transjordan and Palestine came under British control. France ruled Syria, including Lebanon. In 1923, the Republic of Turkey was formed out of all that remained of the former Ottoman Empire. Isolationist America In October 1929, the value of stock on Wall Street fell through the floor. People lost fortunes overnight. Economic depression followed, bringing mass unemployment. 
unemployed people lined up for free food at soup kitchens. Times were hard for farmers, too. In the Midwest, over-farming and drought turned the land to a dust bowl. Farmers could not repay loans taken out to help them survive. They were forced to leave their homes. Loading their worldly possession onto trucks, many families headed west to California to start life over again. Hollywood. World War II, Pacific. On the 7th of December 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, destroying the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Days later, the United States entered World War II. The United States and the Japanese fought many long and bitter battles on sea and land for military supremacy in the Pacific. Towards the end of the war, the Japanese fought desperately to stop the U.S. advance in the Pacific. Flying light planes loaded with explosives, Japanese suicide pilots dive-bombed U.S. ships. These kamikaze attacks sank 34 U.S. Navy ships and damaged a further 368. Hiroshima. On the 6th of August, 1945, the United States dropped the first atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. As the bomb exploded, a white cloud like a gigantic mushroom rose 50,000 feet into the sky. There was a blinding flash of light throughout the city. All that remained of Hiroshima was ruins and ashes. 80,000 people were killed in the immediate blast. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, they presented Germany to the world as a powerful and confident nation. Military parades showed a German army that was strong and well-equipped. Mass rallies celebrated the glory of the Third Reich, the German empire that the Nazis intended to last a thousand years. At the center of these events was Adolf Hitler, the Nazi leader. He made emotional speeches that excited his followers and won him the support of many Germans. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, they began to persecute the Jews who lived in Germany. The Nazis blamed the Jewish community in Germany for many of their country's problems. They publicly burned books written by Jewish authors. They outlawed marriages between Jews and non-Jews. Hitler's stormtroopers painted shop fronts with a Star of David to show that the shops were owned by Jews. Anti-Jewish propaganda appeared on the streets. In schools, the Nazis exposed German children to crude anti-Jewish propaganda. On the 6th of May 1937, the giant passenger airship, the Hindenburg, was nearing the end of its 11th transatlantic voyage between Germany and the United States. Disaster struck as it was approaching its moorings at Lakehurst, New Jersey. The hydrogen-filled airship exploded into flames, and its light structure of fabric and metal struts burnt quickly. It crashed to the ground, killing 35 people. After this accident, hydrogen-filled airships were considered too dangerous to be used for carrying passengers. Many inventive and daring people have tried to achieve human flight. Orville Wright made the first controlled powered flight in 1903 in his plane, the Flyer. 
Once flight was proved to be possible, technical refinements were quick to follow. Not all the ideas were successful. There were ill-fated experiments with vertical takeoff, for example, and rocket propulsion. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh became a national hero in America after he completed the first solo non-stop transatlantic flight. Another American, Amelia Earhart, was the first to fly an even greater distance across the Pacific in 1935. Tragically, she disappeared without trace while attempting an around-the-world flight in 1937. Nuclear-powered submarines like this one carry the Polaris missile system, which was developed by the United States during the Cold War. Polaris can be launched underwater. Each missile carries a nuclear warhead ten times as powerful as the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The successor to Polaris is the Trident missile system. A Trident missile has a greater destructive power than a Polaris missile. It can also travel twice as far as Polaris, up to a maximum of 6,000 miles. The planning for the flag-raising ceremony had been based upon the assumption that a crowd of some 30,000 people would be there. But unfortunately for the planners, the numbers were nearer 300,000. We were surrounded by the happiest of human habits. The crowd had taken complete possession of all the chairs, standing on the backs, arms and seats, approximately six Indians to a chair. In this maelstrom, all were lost in one vast unison, the desire of myriad human beings to reach the central dais with its flagpole. Suddenly, the cheering swelled into a roar, and from where I stood, I could just catch a glimpse of the Governor General's carriage and his bodyguard. The carriage and escort, moving fitfully, at last reached a point about 25 yards from the flagstaff. I could see the Governor General and Lady Mountbatten standing up, waving to the crowd, which was cheering and waving back at them. Prime Minister Nehru made some last frantic efforts to call for order and clear a little space, but his pleas were in vain, as though there was no alternative but for Mountbatten to stay in his carriage, and while the flag was being hoisted, take the salute from there. Just as the flag was unfurled, light rain began to fall, and a rainbow appeared in the sky, matching the saffron, white, and green of the flag. Helicopter Warfare The whirring of helicopter blades was a common sound in war-torn Vietnam. Helicopters transported U.S. troops to the jungle to fight against the North Vietnamese. People were driven from their homes as villages were destroyed by U.S. forces. Public outrage in America and elsewhere led to a peace agreement being signed in 1973, although the fighting continued. On the 30th of April, 1975, the North Vietnamese captured Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam. This brought to an end U.S. involvement in the war. American personnel were forced to make a desperate escape by helicopter from the U.S. Embassy. Post-war United States. Non-violent protest. In 1961, protesters in Albany, Georgia, demonstrated against discrimination. They were arrested despite following the principle of non-violence preached by Martin Luther King Jr. In Washington, on the 28th of August, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. made his famous plea for freedom and equality. I have a dream that one day this nation will live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal.
To my dear children, if you ever have to read this letter, it will be because I am no longer among you. You will hardly remember me, and the youngest children will not remember me at all. Your father has been a man who acted in accordance with what he thought, and there is no denying that he has been faithful to his convictions. Grow up like good revolutionaries. Study a lot so as to master the technique that allows man to master nature. Remember that the revolution is the important thing and that each of us is worth nothing alone. Above all, make yourself capable of responding in your heart of hearts to any injustice committed against anyone in any part of the world. This is the most beautiful quality in a revolutionary. Goodbye forever, children. I still hope to see you again. A big kiss and a big hug from Papa. To broadcast a television program around the world, a ground station must first transmit the program to a communications satellite orbiting in space. The communication satellite receives the program and then transmits it to a ground station on the other side of the world. The program is distributed by cable from the ground station to surrounding households. This transceiver briefcase can be used to transmit messages and receive them. The briefcase could be powered by plugging it into household electricity, plugging it into a car's cigarette lighter using a special adapter, or by using the built-in battery pack. The briefcase was also used to secretly record conversations. The secret agent could use headphones or an earpiece to monitor a conversation or to listen to what was on the tape. Fall of Communism On the night of the 12th of August, 1961, troops from Communist East Germany constructed a barbed wire barrier between East and West Berlin. People trapped on the East German side risked their lives in order to escape to West Germany. The wire was gradually replaced with concrete and steel and became known as the Berlin Wall. The collapse of communism in East Germany led to the opening of the wall on the 9th of November 1989. In the days that followed, Berliners began the task of tearing down the 26 miles of concrete and steel that made up the Berlin Wall. Wars on Television the Six-Day War began on the 5th of June, 1967, when Israel launched a devastating attack on Egypt's airfields. On the 6th and 7th of June, Israel took the Sinai region from Egypt. On the 7th of June, Israel occupied the West Bank and East Jerusalem, which were part of Jordan. On the 9th of June, Israel fought a battle to take the Golan Heights from Syria. During only six days of war, Israel had fought Egypt, Jordan and Syria, and captured territory from all three. The UN called on Israel to withdraw, and eventually set up buffer zones to help keep the peace. The territories remained in dispute for decades. In 1990, President Saddam Hussein of Iraq caused a crisis in the Gulf by sending troops to seize Kuwait. The UN protested, but Saddam refused to retreat. On the 17th of January 1991, Allied forces began six weeks of airborne attacks against Iraq's military targets, roads and factories, using some of the most sophisticated weapons ever devised. Iraqi troops were finally driven from Kuwait in a land offensive that lasted only four days. As Iraqi troops retreated, they deliberately set fire to Kuwait's oil wells. This created a pollution problem on a global scale as thick black clouds of oil smoke turned day into night. The country of Kuwait was left devastated. Moon landing. Two, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. On the 16th of July, 1969, the United States launched Apollo 11. The crew of Neil Armstrong, Edwin Aldrin, and Michael Collins set off on their journey to the moon. Armstrong and Aldrin landed on the moon in the lunar module. Base here. The Eagle has landed. 
Armstrong was the first man to step onto the moon. His first words were, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Having placed a U.S. flag on the moon, Armstrong and Aldrin rejoined Collins in the command module before traveling back to Earth. Eagle, you're looking great. Coming up nine minutes. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. After eight days in space, the crew splashed down safely in the Pacific Ocean on the 24th of July. Mao's Little Red Book Mao's communist regime kept the Chinese population under tight control. He set up the Youth Corps as a way of indoctrinating young people. Corps members worked in the fields to learn about the peasants' problems. After Mao's death in 1976, people expected greater freedom. In June 1989, Protesters gathered in Tiananmen Square, in Beijing, to demand democratic reform. Despite pressure from government troops, the protesters resisted courageously. The world watched in awe at a display of bravery by one particular young man that came to symbolize the unequal struggle between the protesters and the government. Finally, government troops used violence to clear the square of demonstrators. Many people were killed, and a number of the leaders were arrested and imprisoned. Dissent had been silenced. Segregation laws prevented black South Africans from leading ordinary lives. At Sharpville in 1960, many blacks were killed while peacefully protesting against these laws. A crackdown by security forces meant that black South Africans suffered oppression for decades afterwards. In 1989, F.W. de Klerk came to power and promised reform. In May 1994, Mandela was sworn in as the president of South Africa. In his inaugural speech, he never, spoke out against apartheid. Never and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another.